Ladies and gentlemen, Roster Watch Nation, welcome back to the FA Roster Watch Podcast, brought to you by rosterwatch.com, live today from a little bit of a, little bit of a, a, a dark uh, Airbnb space here that we're trying to get spruced up um, on the Roster Watch YouTube and on the Roster Watch Podcast feed. This is day one of the 2024 NFL Combine, our 13th annual trip here to Indianapolis. It looks like Indy's going to be the combine destination of one more year? Is it two more years? So this year and uh, next year. Yeah. Then after that, who knows? But as of now, it needs to be back. Right. As of now, we still know where we're going and what the hell we're doing and everything like that. Um, in the future, things could change. We could be having to be doing a bunch more running around and stuff than we even have done today, where my Apple Watch is going nuts and saying I've set a new steps record and all the rest. Um, we have much to get to today as far as the NFL head coaches and the general managers. I was there with Cody Carpentier, of course. Cody, how are you, bro? Doing fantastic. Uh, got a good day of, you know, we turned off the prospect mind for the day, and it was focused on fantasy football, was focused on. You know, I asked some draft questions and team building questions and really communicating with these GM and coaches and finding about finding out about where their brains are at instead of you know where we've been the last couple of weeks and months talking about prospects. I mean, we're talking fantasy, we're talking NFL, we're talking you know, bad teams getting better, <laughs> maybe bad players in better roles. Yeah. And, and so and you some of these things we're gonna go over. So we'll we'll just go kind of team by team here and we'll um look to give people maybe set the scene a little bit, Cody. So on this Tuesday at the combine, what happens is you have all the GMs, all the head coaches come through. Then on Wednesday, when the prospects start to come in, I believe tomorrow the prospects will be defensive line, maybe some linebackers in the afternoon. And in between those guys, all the stragglers who didn't come through today, uh, who were the head coaches and the GMs, they'll have their availabilities tomorrow. But most of it got done today. Um, with Cody and I, mean, it's just two. It's just two of us, right? It's just two sets of eyes, two sets of ears. So sometimes when there's like five coaches up on the podiums, um, we're having to go from spot to spot. We're having to sort of figure things out. So as we're going through this, I might hear something from Cody from what one of the coaches told him or what one of the teams told him that I didn't even hear about, and probably the same vice versa with Cody. But some of these things you might have heard. You know, I've kind of looked at you know. Um, some of the aggregator sites, you know, t- tons of our questions and our content has sort of been picked up by them. And I, I would say, like, you know, this, it's not our content. The, the, you know, the questions here are free to everybody. <laughs> so, but uh, a lot of the fantasy related questions were due to your boys here at Roster Watch uh, getting our getting our stuff done. So, with that being said, let's just go ahead and dive in. Start, I guess, uh, with the Packers here with uh, Guns, the GM. Um, did you just laugh at my pronunciation? <laughs> what? Goop, goop. <laughs> I think it's right. What is it? Good kunst. Good kunst. Okay. <laughs> well, you're good. Let's get into it. Let's okay. get into it. What did good kunst have to say? I'm I'm Swedish. I should be able to. I should be able to say that correctly. My grandfather's uh, turning over in his grave. Um, Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave is what I'm going to ask about. The, the two tight ends and just mainly, you know, from a team building perspective and from the perspective of how we can sort of look at this young group that we've talked about so much, right. It's what we so badly want to invest in fantasy um, and a dynasty, right. In the whole Jordan love saga, you know, but just, you know, we, we like Jordan love. We like the fact that, um, he has these associated pieces that are really right now on, on cheap rookie second year kind of deals. And they all are right. We talked about it coming into this season, how the only pass catcher that Jordan Love had coming into 2023, that was not a first or second year player was Josiah DeGuara. Everybody else was either a rookie or a second year player. Uh, a bunch of good young talent there. And a spe- when they, when they double tap tied in with, Luke Musgrave and with Tucker Craft, we we're like, man, they kind of, it, it's just sort of like, you Who's know, right? yeah, it, it just felt like it kind of took a piece off the board of tight end because these guys are going to cancel themselves out and all the rest. But then what happened was through the course of the season, Luke Musgrave comes in, he's a, he's a good part of the offense, starable player in fantasy. He gets hurt, Tucker Craft comes in, I mean, maybe he has more, 
highlight that it plays with his athleticism. Um, and I just, my question was, are these two guys redundant? Like, do you know, can they be on the field at the same time? Like, how do you, how do you guys view them? And um, is it going to be something where one of these guys has to come off the football field for the other one to play? And what he said was that, you know, he just basically said that platitudes about tight ends, all the rest of it. I think the most important thing was, as you see, he said at the end, he said it's, it's going to be really fun to see those guys on the field at the same time next year. Yeah. And so that to me means I'll be, I'll be curious to ask you because I immediately went back up to the media room after that and just looked up Jaden Reed, his slot rate last year, because I knew it was sky high, right? Looked it up. He was like fourth in the league as far as that. It's like 76% he was in the slot. And so are you are they really gonna take their best guy off the field? Because the next question to him was about Christian Watson and is he the number one wide receiver? Um and to that he gave the same answer that some of these other guys gave about number one wide receiver. Uh, I don't want to label him like that. I don't want to talk about him like that. I don't want to do any of this stuff. You know that Christian Watson plays outside, you know that Wicks plays outside, you know that Romeo Dobbs plays outside. If they're gonna be at 12 personnel, what is what exactly does that mean for Jay and Reed? And to me, I think it's like, man, it feels like a little bit of a bummer that we're going to have such a murky situation with these two. The projections are going to be hard preseason. Well, you, the thing is, is he brings up that conversation to tight ends, whilst you know what you just brought up about Jay Reed's slot and the growth and maturation that we saw from Don Tate and Wicks towards the end of the season and the guy you asked about, Christian Watson. So that's five dudes. And not to mention Bo Melton was and, and, good. Yeah, but I mean, let's be honest, in that conversation right now, like, the conversation is, is more about like how they're going to, you know, deploy this offense. And are they really going to run look good. three wide receivers and two tights at the same time? No, like they just can't. They can't. You, physically, you physically can't. And then you're forgetting Aaron Jones is still on the roster. If you go empty, you can't. But exactly, Aaron Jones is still on the roster. Right. But then you're not going to do that. So, you know, it, it will be interesting to kind of look, you know, as we get closer to the season. And take this note and carry it into like our projections and visualize what it potentially looks like. Um, you know, if they do run too tight, is it going to be swapping of Wicks and Watson? Is it going to be you know Reed comes out the field? There's no slot. It's you can't take Reed off the field. That's what I'm saying. You yeah. Can't. So it's just it was this can be an interesting thing to follow. It just makes this thing more murky. Like I said, unfortunate for us that we want to invest in fantasy as far as Jordan Love's associated pieces. Honestly, it makes maybe Jordan Love becomes a guy you say like like more valuable than saying, like, well, I don't know where he's going to come from. I don't know who I'm going to stack him with as far as if I'm trying to stack in Dynasty or in redraft. But whenever you have Love, you realize, well, whether it's Kraft out there, whether it's Musgrave, whether it's Jaden Reed, whether it's Dobbs, whether it's Wicks, whether it's any of the rest of these dudes, right? Um, he, he'll be able to eat up all of those fantasy points. Next, you talked to Dan Campbell, and for the second year in a row, you brought up Jamison Williams. Yeah. And last year, one of our takeaways was that it was going to be, you know, a, a bigger year than was his rookie season, of course, because he was dealing with an injury. Well, he said last year, it feels like you got, a, it feels like you got a bonus first round pick. Yeah. And, and, and it looked like, you know, he, he started to come on as the season got on, but what did he have to say today? Because I missed this one. Okay, so what he said was that um, – so he said that, yeah, he progressed. And when he was able to come back off suspension, all we asked him was uh, for growth. He just got better and better and just become one of the guys. They, they, they wanted him to feel – man, I don't think that Jameson Williams, they ever thought that he felt like he was just one of the dudes on that team. And, and look, I know for me, he hasn't been in the minutiae. Yeah. yeah, and I know that like a lot of people will be like, well, what does that even mean? And, but I mean, to the to, to like to Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes, that's that means that's all that it means. Yes, yeah, that's right. The whole hashtag one pride. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like so. Um, the bottom line is the the takeaway here is the quote: "He's going to push to be a full time starter." That's massive. Well, I think I think when you hear that in year three for a guy you took it what twelve overall or whatever it was, like. You know that you're basically saying he's pushing to be a full time starter now. You're talking about a guy that's on the precipice of becoming a big time bust. But also, yeah, like you can, you can compare that situation to Kevin kind of Overseen with Trayvon Burks, right? He's in the 80s, you know, on that on that custom talking about him later. But why I'm bringing that up is because 
you just talked about it, where he's, you know, he hasn't really felt like he's a part of the team per se, because remember that rookie year, he's coming off the ACL and he was, you know, off the field working out, which when you're, when you're training, when you're doing rehab and stuff, you're not really with the team. And then this year with suspension, you can't be with the team when you're suspended. So he, this will be, as long as he doesn't get suspended or hurt again, this will be his first full off season and first full, like end of the season where he's, with the team every day, taking part in every single practice, every single game, every single opportunity to build and grow. And that much in two role is right there. Yeah. So it, to, to be an every to you know to be an every down starter is what they're saying. That's what he's they're 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 telling us at least now he feels like he's part of it. It's just so wild to me that you got like that would get integrated in with the team to start to where it feels it feels like they're just now saying, all right, now he can now he can start his journey with the Lions. We're talking about a good is so, so wide in the position of the Lions are in. Yep, for sure. All right, next up. Uh next up the Chargers. I talked to the new general manager Hort Hortz Hortitz? Hortiz. Hortiz. Yeah. Not not Ian Hortiz. Hortiz. Ortiz. Ortiz, there we go. I got it. I got it. I got it. I asked him with the departure of Austin Eckler, uh, what the running back running back room looks like uh, with guys like Isaiah Spiller uh, amongst them. And basically, what he said was, you know, Austin Eckler finally getting to test for agency, and that's you know good on his end. We're going to have conversations with him, but as far as anybody on this roster, it's an opportunity for them to all grow in their role. And he basically just kept on going on. And everybody that's currently on this roster. There's going to be tons of opportunities. And in the back of my head, I didn't want to double take this question because normally you only get time for maybe one, maybe two. And I didn't want to double down into it. But my thought process while he was saying opportunity, anybody on the roster is going to get opportunity. You know, you got to get all this time to make opportunity. Like, I'm thinking to myself, what opportunity do they have to impress you between now and the draft? They don't. They have no opportunity. In, in real life, what are they going to do? They're going to come in. This is a real question for you. What do you think the opportunity is for you to say it's between now and April 26th? to earn um, the opportunity to be the one. And the reason I say April 26th is because of stay in the building. Stay in the building. Just live in it. Live in it. I guess you got to do it. Sleep up, live it. Say, man, like, just say, man. Order for, 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 for Hortis. Just uh, Hort, 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 Hortiz. <laughs> Hortiz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, man, I think Spiller, look, he's a dude who I am. Um, Don't say it. The ship has sailed when I say Spiller. No, he's a guy that in the leagues where I have him in the deep dunk. Dude, some of these 14 team dynasty leagues we play in, you got it, you got a roster these dudes, right? You would have said a lot of people would have said that the ship would have been sailed on like Kyron Williams and stuff. Like some of these guys, you, it's that's one that's one hundred percent true. Dude. And so some of these dudes you just kind of got to see. Isaiah Spiller was there during a time playing with players that turned out to be really good, like H and we have Nia Smith in this class and all the you know Texas AM dudes and Spiller at one point in time was in kind of an outfit in, in that group. So um Spiller for sure. It's like would you rather would you rather have in Dynasty Isaiah Spiller or a fourth round rookie pick? Fourth round rookie pick. Not me. Yes. Are you kidding? Yes. Why? So you get like Dylan Loud or something like this? You can, you can, you can, you can get a lot of running backs. In a, in a okay. Uh, oh, right. In a in a fourth round non super flex rookie draft. Sure. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, but we'll, but we're we're trying to gauge value, right? That's kind sure. of maybe take a shot on Spiller. Just, sure. just, just, just see, right? I don't hate it. Um, you talk about the running, but this guy's a little bit better than Isaiah Spiller. It's Isaiah Spears. So. Uh, Talked to Rand Carpenter, the GM for the Titans, about Ty J. Spears. And you know, who, who knows with Derrick Henry, they talked about how important Tennessee is to him, how important the Titans are to Derrick Henry, all the rest of it. We don't know what's going to happen. It feels like to me that they're definitely it, – it, it feels like the time's gotten stale, yeah. right? I mean, new coaches, you know, new – things feel like they're – me need to maybe start a little bit anew with the Will Levis era, and this is not the deep Ember um, era anymore. Um, so with Rand Carthen, he talks a lot about the team being built with the right kinds of players, and he talks about this all the time. And whenever he talks about it, when he asked, when he talks about Spears, he just said he's a guy that we 
you know, he's very passionate about football. He loves the game. He's a hard worker. I think you guys have gotten to know him. That's how he's wired. That's what I love about him. He's one of those guys that's always in the building. You know, there were a lot of concerns about his knee coming out. And that's the thing about his knee, right? Because Rap Sheet reported in May of last year that it was not only cartilage loss in the one knee. That it, and we told you guys on this the senior bowl, he's got a gnarly knee scar. And it's, you, you say... It, it, it was the it was the cartilage loss. It was the arthritis. It was the fact that he didn't have an he didn't he didn't even have an ACL. That that was the the reporting. And what I remember being his I believe his right right right. Um, and so, man, given all those concerns, even with the, he's just like he's just like um, he missed no practices. He just said he just said there were so many concerns about his knee, but he he never missed a practice, never missed a game. There was any of it. You, you got saw him. We all saw him. He looked great when he was in there. Looks like a dynamic all around back. I think, though, the fact that that knee was brought up in the question, it goes to show that they still know that stuff. They, like, they're like they still aware of that thing. And this is not going to be something where if Henry moves on, like Tajay Spears is never going to move. No one's going to be a Derrick Henry. Like, no one's going to be the, it's just like, this is a new, this is a new kind of offense. But could Tajay Spears be a dynamic 1A? In that thing for one year, one I, I, I worry about him in Dynasty, just like you've always said that we should, going back to the draft last year. But I think it redraft, man, Ty J. Spears, and I don't have the uh, best ball cheat sheet pulled up right now, but I believe he's going, what, seventh round, something like that? And it's been going up, too. Yeah, it could be, you know, just something interesting to watch there. And we're big Ty J. Spears fans. It's just that, you know, the, the knee stuff was uh, troublesome. So I want to remind you guys to please click that like and subscribe button as you're here tapped into Roster Watch on YouTube. We're going to be live today. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. We're going to be here tracking the prospects all the way through the week, talking to the GMs, talking to the coaches, bringing you the boots on the ground content like we do at all of the events throughout the spring, summer, and fall. We're going to keep on getting into it, just trying to go follow everything on social media at Roster Watch. Like, like the show. Subscribe to the channel. Make Byron happy. <laughs> Make us all it. Some more Falcons content here. Um, running back content, I should say. I asked Terry Fonda, I said, you know, Terry, you drafted a running back in the fourth round in Tyler Algier. You might know him, right? Rushed for 1,000 yards, was running back 26 in fantasy points per game as a rookie, four touchdowns, rang a bell. What made you want to draft a running back in the first round this year? And he basically went on to tell – me that it's not about the position, it's about the player, it's about their, their their makeup, what they bring to the table, and essentially saying that guys like Bijan, you don't draft because they're good running backs and they're talented running backs, that's part of it. But when they when you bring them into a building, they're multipliers, they make everybody around them better, and they're what you want your team to be built upon. And I thought that was very interesting because we always hear the conversation, you know, Saquon, you know, that was the Gettleman pick the fourth overall, and he caught so much flack for that. And you never really heard him talk about it from this. And I'm not saying Saquon's not a all the player, team builder, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the conversation was had right here of the importance of the pick and why they made it. And now the Falcons have spent three consecutive years, you know, top ten picks, eight, eight, and like eight, eight, six, eight, eight, four, whatever it was, top, top nine, eight, on the field guy. guys. And I, mean, I was progressing to why, why? Yeah. And he basically just went into it saying it was culture. In I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think Fawn goes long for that job, man. Um, but look, well, I can talk all day about Bijan Robinson. And I'm like, yes, you meet him, you're like, oh gosh, we want him on the team. Yeah. But it's, it's like the guy's got a hard goal. He's got a, a, a smile in the melting room. And um, he's an awesome player. And people close to the team have told us that to expect a much bigger role out of him next year, especially. Uh, within not having the advantage of knowing who the quarterback's going to be, yeah. you know, right? So I, I what to see with the quarterback, but with the new coaching staff that's coming in, we've talked about this often about um, uh, as far as as far as you know from an office coordinator standpoint, what he's been able to see during the, you know time with time with the Rams, they 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 they. they generally tend to lean on one running back and give him the work, give him the touch, just let him be an all-around guy. So that's kind of the narrative that's percolating around some of the Atlanta people here around Indy that Bijan should be in for a bigger season regardless of who they get as a signal caller. Um, the Baltimore Ravens, Eric DaCosta, one of the better interviews every single year, but DaCosta was asked, this is not something I asked, but it was one of the questions brought up 
I just asked him the question about, you know, was he, last year you alluded to the importance of finding a wide receiver one in the draft. Felt like they did that in Zay Flowers. And talk about how important it is to continue to add to this room. He kind of said, you know, the wide receiver room is something you want to continually add depth to because these guys are built like race cars. And race cars break down and these players break down. So I think that's going to be a position to continue to target. He, he mentioned Odell Beckham. That's a conversation that needs to be had. But in a different question that was asked, um, how you look at these young guys and how they're growing. And Flowers and Mitchell is exactly how he asked it. His response to what do you think about the growth of these young guys in Flowers and Mitchell was, I'm most excited about the growth. Sorry, this was actually part of my sentence. I'm most excited about the growth of Rashad Bateman. Oh, yeah. And Bateman's going to have an ex- extended role this year. Bateman's going to get more opportunities. I want to see him. Do you buy it? I don't know. Yeah, he came up. He came up. It was like, oh, like it was like the question was like Mitchell and Flowers. What do you think? And he's like Bateman. Like it was like what? Like, right. No, yeah, no, it was. It was like it, it felt like a complete like non 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 sequitur. It's just like he just came out. You weren't asking that. Shit. No, nobody asked. But he, but he was. He is, he associates Bateman as one of the young players on the team, that he's expected which is a good step. So yeah, I think that that's cool. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention about the Ravens is that while this wasn't said, every context clue that you could possibly get from the body language and from the things that were said and the things that weren't said is that J.K. Dobbins doesn't seem to be a part of the picture. They brought him up a few times. I mean, it just doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't. Yeah. Like, did you hear anything to where they said? They just said, they. the one thing I did hear from, I can't think it was hard about it, was he's like, yeah, we're looking – we love Keaton. We're looking for Gus to get back healthy. And then, you know, JK's floating out there as well. Yeah. And and it's like float, I was like, floating out there? What do you mean floating out there? You, you, and, and, then, and then you have – And then, and then, and then you have DaCosta saying that Justice Hill was like the secret weapon of the team this year, right? Talking about how he was one of the – like this magical creature that the team – like, so who knows? It doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like JK. Too, uh, it, doesn't feel like he's going to do that. Yeah, and do you know what, man? He could be one of these guys in the next team. Go pick up for cheap. You know? Like, I'm obviously going and do you, do you think the he, price set checks on, on J.K. Dobbins. Do you think there's a couple of years left, or do you think he's potentially in line for, like, a, a, a Lev Bell, Todd Gurley type of just kind of like a disappearance? I know, I don't want to, like, I mean, wish cast on anybody else. Because he, he's dealing with an but I, I think the price is cheap enough right now. He's, he's strong. He's been good. Yeah. Go there and get it. One of my favorite notes today was actually from Sean Payton, who very, 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 very long-winded. I think he might have answered six questions in 15 minutes. Um, but I asked him, I said, how do you explain the utilization of Marvin Minutes, who was your first pick? I mean, and I love the way that Cody phrased that. Cody was demanding that Sean Payton explain himself. Explain your utilization. <laughs> because everybody, you know, everybody on Twitter was absolutely pissed at the utilization of Marvin Minutes because the first pick Sean Payton ever spent a wide receiver, and it was horrible. And I said, how do you compare him to Brandon Cooks, Kenny Stills, which were his first two wide receiver picks back-to-back years um, for the Broncos? And he basically said, you know, without that comparison, we really loved what Mims brought to the table as a returner. And in, and I quote, I really think the only thing that really stopped his progress as a receiver was us and trying to find new roles. But every time we gave him an opportunity, he made the most of it. So – we're looking forward to expanding that role this year. The only thing that stopped him was, was him. He said, Russ. Us. Us. <laughs> Russ. Us. No, I don't know. It's like uh, the whole Marvin Mims thing. I, I, I feel like with that, you know, that's a kind of uh, once bitten, twice shy thing for me. They're definitely in the, as far as reject, I think a dynasty is still a fine hole. And, the, and these are all really good. These are all really good signs that, like Sean Payton saying, that, yeah, and that's a kind of like we messed that up. Yeah. Yeah, um, but as far as any, like I was, like I was telling Cody today, um, it was just really cemented with me today. For so I don't know why it had become like completely cemented before, but there's it's an absolute like like lock, and it's a truth that there's no reconciling anything with Russ Wilson and, and with this them working with this team. I mean they they just, they're just they're talking about him like he's in the past tense and the media is asking about what can you do to asking George Payton, what can you do to trade up to get to number one? And George Payton's like, look, we don't have the draft capital to get from 12 to one. 
you know, obviously he that that means that he's done no, he's, sure. he's done his price check, which is good. So, well, you should. Not, like, you're not a big Peyton fan myself, but just like you guys in Dynasty, man, you should be constantly doing price checks on guys, just kind of seeing. And that's your job as a GM. You sit there all day. You got to pull up other GMs. You got to figure out what the hell they value you and how they value picks. And so they've obviously looked, looked into that. Speaking of that, as far as that first pick, and as far as oh, you want to talk about. So I saw the Bears, but the, but the Buccaneers room. The Bucs is a small one. I just asked how you analyze the wide receiver room and the growth of Trey Palmer this year. The dog, Trey Palmer, the number of uh, dog last year. He said, obviously, Trey's very fast. But I think a big thing, he said, he learned multiple positions for us, which obviously the rookie is tough, as he mentions. But as you guys know, learning those positions as a rookie. And so we talk about special teams and the importance of being able to be good at special teams as a rookie to get on the field. If you can pick up multiple positions, especially when you're in a room with Godwin and Evans mm-hmm. and things alike, yep. that's a good way to get on the field. Yep. Because opportunities will open up. Evans might miss a couple plays, Godwin might miss a couple games, whatever it may be. And he said that that was big for Palmer. He also, I brought up Palmer, he brought up Rakeem Jarrett from Maryland. Who's a pretty good mm-hmm. slot receiver? So part yeah. of that part of that three pack from last year. Yep. 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 There's three Maryland guys. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. So you know, if, if you are, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's any Raheem Jarrett Troopers out there, but I know he's free in Dynasty if you're in those deep leagues. Have that. He did mention it. Mike Evans leaves and departs. Trey Palmer moves up, as does Mr. Raheem Jarrett. The other one in that offense uh, was Sean Tucker. I asked about. Uh, what can, you, what can you expect in that role? He said it was you know similar to Jameson Williams coming in as a rookie. That rookie season, he missed uh, most of the training camp because of injury. Sean Tucker had a, his heart ailment that came up at the, season, at the combine last year. And he basically just talked about Sean Tucker has the size. He has the talent. He has the feet. Mm-hmm. He has everything we want in a running back. But he just hasn't had a full offseason. So he's looking forward to seeing him have a full offseason. And basically what he said in quotes is, I can say we're hopeful for that role to expand. Uh, so that, that was kind of interesting about uh, Sean Tucker. I don't know if you have comments on that. Otherwise, we can move on. No, to let's, let's yeah, yeah. 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 the Bears, man. I love this. I love this one. And you were the one that asked it. Like, man, there were so many people around Everett Blues, and I think that the reason why is just because so much talk revolves around that first overall it's, pick. I don't know, this is one second here. I don't want to know it. Did you notice it today? For me, it was super annoying because I, I'm going to go up there and I want to, I want to actually find something out. And it felt like a lot of these coaches were asked and GMs, how do you how do you address the quarterback? How do you evaluate quarterback? What's quarterback? What do you what about your quarterback? What's what about the S two tests? The S two tests. David Mulgaz guys and athletes first not taking them. It's like the, these these people ask many questions and just and just wait till the prospects tomorrow. Oh, I can't, I'm, I wait till the stuff from the guy with the Pittsburgh Tower Podcast is walking up to every single prospect and busting and saying, have you, have you met with the Steelers? They'll be like, yeah, I know them at the senior bowl, and, but I don't have an official with them here. You, like, And it's just every single prospect they're going to go around doing it. So it's, it, it, yeah. it's, 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 have, you, have you met with the Houston Texans? How about Dallas? I haven't met with any of them. I haven't met with any of them. Roshan Johnson. Um, I asked Matt Amber Blues, have you seen enough out of Roshan Johnson last year to kind of depend on him as a lead back going forward? And he bursted out kind of like Jim Harbaugh did, John Harbaugh did, about uh, Rashad Bateman. And he goes, yeah, I love Rashad. And he, he was just saying, basically, he's done a great job. Uh, we'll see how he develops. He had a good rookie year. And I've always said that, you know, um, from the first year to the second year. from year one to year two. That's, that's, that's the big one. That's the big one. And so he's got a full offseason. Like you hear this a lot out of these rookies. And they go, you know, our rookie season just rolls right into combine training, rolls right into minicamp, rolls right into the season. Yeah. You don't get an offseason to grow or learn. And this is now Roshan's opportunity. No deal on the foreman. Herbert is still there. Yeah. Um, but the writing feels like it's on the wall. There's Dude. an opportunity for and he's, and he's a fan favorite because you tweet that stuff out, and every Chicago fan is just you yeah, know, they know. It, they're engaging. They're all big fans, man. They want it to be Roshan season. We want it to be Roshan season. You can go to Schneider. You can go to Schneider. Okay, so John Schneider, man, I asked what the best um what the best touch split is between Ken Walker and Zach Charbonnet. And if you could kind of tell me as the GM, you drafted these two guys, right? Well, you know, how you see their styles and their uh, their play styles 
you know, interacting with him. Like, what's what? What is that interplay like? How does that work out on the football field? And he just said that um, he said, "Well, that's to be up to Coach Grubb." Was what's his name? Ryan 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 Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Grubb. So the, so that was Caleb DeBoer's offensive coordinator in Washington. Correct. Um, and dude, I mean, we saw with we we saw with Dylan with I mean Dylan Johnson got a bunch like he he would feature one you know he, he would block Dylan Johnson he would rush he, he would he would feature that guy sure Dylan Johnson by the way man I need to show you some of the all twenty twos from Washington like some of the all twenty two stuff on him that I just got that I haven't shared with you yet like some like it's one of these it's just it's one of these ones where it's like man you know he's he, he's a little bit more more impressive on 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 the on the uh, on the uh, all twenty two stuff, but uh, all the, all that time, Schneider's like man, he wouldn't even answer. He just said that they have four guys that they really love. Yeah, and, and so can we? Can so we? So we know that there's, there's Ken Walker. We know the Charbonnet. We know the Kenny McIntosh from Georgia, the rookie last year, the senior role, and then like if he, because DJ Dallas is set to be a free agent. They also oh, have – Fulmer was in Chicago. Um, they, it's Brian Kovac. Brian Kovac, who they signed to a futures deal right after the season. And I don't know if that's the fourth game. But look, that's, all, that's the fourth game. But here's the, here, here, here's the takeaway in, in the point. If, if we're still talking about these four guys, though, if we're still talking about like four dudes mixing in, I don't care if it's just one dude mixing in for four touches and one dude mixing in for two touches. It's too much. It's and it, it's, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to make both of those guys at the cost of the point right now in early best ball. Not not be worth it with as awesome as Ken Walker is, and with as much as we think that Zach Charbonnet has such a great, well-rounded skill set. Those guys come. I wanted to say, do they come from each other like peanut butter and jelly? We can't wait to get those two guys going. Get them both healthy, and like let's let's see what we got. It's why we it's why we it's why we have day two draft capital on these guys. You know, so the tough talking about was Kenny McIntosh even drafted, or was he seventh round? And Kenny McIntosh was a seventh round pick. Yeah. yeah. The running back, uh, running back coach was super excited about that one. We're going to be a little hungry here. But, uh, right, let's go we'll finish out here with another couple of running backs and stuff like that. But please remember to click that like button. Click subscribe. We're going to finish up some of our notes here for the NFL Combine day one. We'll move back tomorrow night as well as Thursday and Friday night as we recap. Maddie Keyword is a player profiler joining us. Maddie Keyword. Starting so Player profile nation. Maddie Keyword joining me here. So we had Tom Telesco jump ship from the Chargers and get fired from the Chargers and then get the job uh, with the Raiders in division. Um, and I asked him, uh, how do you analyze the roster, the running back position, and do you visualize Zamir White as a potential lead back in the league? And he basically said, uh, from what I see, he's a very good player, but like many teams in the league, and this is something we heard a bunch last year, it's the only player here, only, the only GM that said this this year, um, was – he has the size, he has the speed, but like every team, we don't want to have just one guy. We want to have two, we want to have three guys. So the thought that Samir White is going to come in and be Josh Jacobs, I mean, he's already there. Come in and just be Josh Jacobs, I would say, is nil. Um, the opportunity for Josh Jacobs to come back is like, to run. He's like, so let's go. To, uh, to let's not, I don't think Jacobs is going to be back. But, if, but here's the thing. It's like if, it, if, if it's Samir White and other guys who are bad, the same way that, say, what Josh Kelly, Kelly. Look at Samir and Zeke. Is that Josh Kelly and Larry Roundtree and these dudes that Telesco drafted from the senior bowl to, 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 to try and compliment Austin Eckler? You know what I mean? It's like you end up stabbing your dude. <laughs> it's like maybe Telesco will draft that again, and then you know they'll just have to play have to play Zamir. I guess. I, I don't I mean, yeah, I guess to that point, I don't trust him to draft the right player, but Maybe he brings in a Zeke or something along those lines. Um, you, I don't want to talk about that one. Um, Dan Morgan. Oh, dude, end it, let's, let's end it with the Chua talk and with the Devin single period. All right, so Dan Morgan, I took Dan Morgan, who's now the general manager for the Panthers. Um, I asked him the same question. Do you view Chuba Hubbard as the lead back going forward? And I phrased this question exactly like I did because, quite frankly, I forgot Miles Sanders existed. I think as did most fantasy people. He's down and, bad. And Dan Morgan said, yeah, as of now, he's the lead back going forward. You know, him along with uh, Miles Sanders, you know, I think he's a, you know, he's, he's a really good back. But basically saying Chuba's the lead back going forward. And, and they do have these two guys here. And, again, Miles has a contract. Um, 
think they have Spencer Brown under under contract under retention. He's a guy from like UAB who's adequate and does some special teams things. I think also uh, Raheem Blackshear, another special teams guy. So I don't see them adding anybody really this offseason unless they cut cut ties and you know group or unless they're lying. Yeah, unless they're completely lying. Yeah. <laughs> right now, as it seems, I can see them lying, man. I'm not, but yeah, but. Yeah. You have to, you have to, I would especially with that, especially with what Dave Canales was saying today yeah. about you got to run the football. I don't care. I'm not going to negotiate. This isn't how you yeah. do it. No, so you got to win this NFC South. You got to run this football. You got to do it. I'm not going to negotiate about it. I don't care. It's a non-negotiable. You have to be able to run the football. So if that's the case, and we have Chuba Hubbard. Because look, Miles Sanders at this point, I was telling Cody he's the worst back in the league that size tank tank Bigsby, which Cody took took uh, <laughs> which Cody took uh, what, what exception to. Um, but if it is Chuba and he dodges all the bullets like like Neo in the Matrix that I was talking about, Canales is gonna run. He's like he is he's going to run. Uh, speaking of running, we'll just stop it here with Danico Ryan's dude. This guy loves Devin Singletary. You asked me about Devin Singletary, like or I asked you about asked. Devin Singletary, and his face just lit up. And he said, like, yeah, it's like we were so pleased with Devin. Um, I, I just want to know, like, are you interested in bringing him back? He looked like a new guy, right? He looked like a new guy with the Texans. And he said, you know, we'll see what happens in free agency. We would love to have him back just because uh, what he brought to our team, he was definitely a real the the bright spot for us is in our running back room, which might say something about Damian Pierce. Um, but I do think in situations like this, if it is like Devin Singletary is going to go out on the free agent market based on what he's done for his entire career and command some kind of huge, um, you know, some huge deal where they have to go back and forth. I don't think the Texans are interested in kind of doing that over Devin Singletary, right? But I think they can give him a fair, good market deal and say, look, we want you back. If we want you back. And don't you want to come back to be in the Slovak Stroud office that was the one that rejuvenated your career? And then we'll see what happens. You know, you break some incentives, you do some stuff, we restructure, we do some stuff like that. I think it is in everybody's best interest, fantasy owners and managers included, for Devin Singletary to get back to Houston.